Welcome to Heroes of the Faith, where my guests today are Roger and Faith Foster. Roger and Faith are the founders and the leaders of the ICFAS Christian Fellowship. And I hope that my statistics are right, because I understand that ICFAS currently comprises 15 local congregations here in London, a network of 80 UK link churches and work overseas in approximately 16 nations. Welcome to you both. Are those Thank statistics you. right, Roger? Roughly right, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> the heroes of the faith. Who, if I said to you, who's your hero of the faith, what would you say? Goodness, you only want one. Well. <laughs> um, I must say that soon after I was converted, I read the two flat volumes of Hudson Taylor mm. and found that a wonderful founding or base for my Christian life and development. Yeah. But there are others, and John Wesley's one I'd love to see uh, England evangelise, Brit the British Isles evangelise in the way that he did it. Mm. Um, not necessarily with a horse, but uh, <laughs> that we get all those through the land again. Uh, there are others, of course, and uh, I suppose I should say Francis of Assisi, because it was reading G.K. Chesterton's book on Francis of Assisi that, first of all, uh, led me to start to say, well, what did this man have? And uh, you know, what is this Jesus that he was so fond of? And uh, so I began to read the New Testament. Because you read why. history and, and maths at Cambridge, didn't you? I read theology and maths. Theolo yeah. Theology and maths yes. at, at Cambridge. Yes. So were you at that stage a, a believer or did that come later? Or I'd been brought up in a kind of a liberal um, context and I was questioning everything when I went up to university. I was pretty agnostic. But I'd begun to read the New Testament because of reading G.K. Teston's book. And when I got up to Cambridge, I found that there were uh, so-called intelligence, <laughs> one or two of us might be from there, um, people who really did uh, have a living faith in Christ. And I was very impressed by that. And so my reading of the New Testament just naturally led into seeing, oh, this is who Christ is. And I gave my life to uh, our Lord at the end of that particular first term. And um, I was just absolutely overwhelmed with uh, the experience because I, I, I never really understood how you could love somebody you can't see and where mm -hmm. is he? Mm -hmm. But I found you could love Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really uh, began my whole experience of being a Christian. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Faith, what about you? Any heroes? Well, again, there's always so many, but, uh, and I was thinking at different stages of my life. So by the time I was mid-teens, I believed that God was calling me to serve him. And my pastor at that time recommended me to read books of uh, missionary, women missionaries, because he assumed that if I was going to serve God, that would be overseas. And, and I was very happy with that. I assumed the same, I think. So I read the various, you know, Mary Slessor, Gladys Awood, and so on. But the one that, that gripped me first was uh, Amy Carmichael probably because Amy Carmichael was quite a literary person. She was also a poet. And um, even then I was writing poetry. I still do uh, from time to time. So that appealed to me. Um, but a little bit later than that, when just before we were married, I was given um, a book on J.O. Fraser, Fraser of Lisuland. And I would say that that book has probably impacted me more deeply than any other because Fraser was a young man who went out to southwest China and Burma when he was uh, only 22, 23. But he, and by the time he was 24, he was running a mission station in the way that they did then. He went out in about 1915, that sort of time. And he, um, he began to pioneer evangelize the Lisu people, tribes people, who were straddling China and Burma. And uh, they were completely unevangelized. They were demon worshippers. But he began to pray for them, and he began to ask God to teach him how to pray. And as he did, he kept a journal, and he also wrote letters home to his prayer group. And he came to some quite, for his day, quite remarkable understanding of the role of faith and prayer, of breakthrough prayer, of perseverance in prayer. And he would write this out. And I was given his biography when I was just 22 by some missionary friends of mine. And I found it hugely inspirational to understand the connection between prayer 
and church planting, prayer and everything really. Prayer is the base. But not that we just become, what impressed me about Fraser was, he was not, he wasn't a monk in a monastery somewhere, not, no disrespects to that, but what I mean is he was right on the front line every day evangelizing. His prayer, he always said that he was a very pragmatic person and he believed in prayer because he found it worked. And I like that because I tend to be a bit pragmatic myself. And so I found that his book and the long chapters he has were in the biography, uh, the quotes from his journal where he's beginning to understand prayer from the word of God and from his own experience. They totally impacted my life in a way that it was year after year I began to realize how much the things I'd learned from Fraser had affected me in realizing the supremacy of prayer, the, the, the foundational aspect of it in our work. And I think we always have, very failingly, because like everybody, none of us are very good at prayer, but understanding how to listen to God, how to break through, how to wage spiritual warfare, not in this kind of gung-ho way that people do, but in a serious way where we take the power of the cross, what Jesus has overcome the evil one and held to that and pushed through with that. Fraser is, is an excellent book to read on the, these issues of prayer. And I, therefore, I always say when people ask me, Ultimately, Fraser's book changed my whole perception of spiritual activity and life and work. The other person who, after we planted Ichthys, um, a couple of years in, I came across the biography of Catherine Booth, wife of the founder of the Salvation Army. And since they were working also in, um, city, you know, in London and in downtown areas, and we were doing the same, that she, her biography also inspired me. But I think she came a little bit later, my understanding, which has been so important to me. I still love to go back and read some of Fraser's passages on prayer. I can imagine some of our viewers are already saying, I've never heard of this person, Fraser, no, before. most people haven't. So what's the book and okay, is it well, still obtainable? Um, the book that I read first, I think is out of print for quite a long while, it's, it was called Behind the Ranges and it was by Mrs. Howard Taylor of the China Inland Mission because that was the mission he went out with, it's now Overseas right. Missionary Fellowship. Um, and, but there was a more, about 20 years or so ago, another book was published which was written by his daughter, which covers much the same ground and it's called Mountain Rain. Mm. I can't remember her married name, she was Eileen, originally Eileen Fraser, but I don't remember her surname, but it's called Mountain Rain. You can read a Fraser in that. Yet I'm amazed that so few people in Christian ministry have... I noticed so recently, I, I noticed that Terry Virgo mentioned that Fraser's biography had hugely influenced him. I found that interesting. It was literally only about a month right. ago I noticed. Because all, all the people you've mentioned, I'm very familiar with, but, yes, but Fraser yes. I'm not. So. Yes. Oh, well, you've missed a treat and you must read his work. We'll because try and... he saw the most amazing breakthrough. <laughs> yes. and, and he also was one of those who believed that God gave him a word. And when God has said to you, this is going to happen, it will happen. That's what he mm. would. So he, he prayed for five years. Then he wrote in his journal, God told me today that he's heard my prayers and that I will see hundreds of Lisu families come to the Lord. And he wrote it down. And then he said he was hugely assailed by the enemy. He, his mind was assailed, he was depressed, he wanted to give up and go home. He even felt suicidal at times, but he held his ground with the help of his praying friends at home who were really holding him up. And he said 20 months after he'd heard that, the first Lisu family turned to the Lord. And then it was like a domino effect. And he saw, I mean, thousands of Lisu were Christians. And today the Lisu tribe, which is in, as I say, straddles Burma and China, they have very strong church. They, they reckon that 90% of the Lisu are Christians today. Mm. It's a very, very, they, they have a very thriving Bible school, which a couple of our own workers have been to and taught in. You know, we, mm. our overseas workers have gone there. So it's, it's a lasting work. That's what I like too. Mm. Fruit that remains. That's Exciting. what we want. Exciting. And, and the thing about your heroes, both the heroes you've said, that, that they're people of prayer, they're people of faith, yes. Yes. and they're people of evangelism. <laughs> yes, and, and I guess when we talked last <laughs> yes. week, um, the thing that was on your heart as you began ICFAS was this one of reaching out and evangelizing or re-evangelizing yes. as you, you express it. I mean, here we are today. Um, what's your vision? How... How as a church, how as Christians, mm -hmm. are we going to reach out and re-evangelise in our country? Well, we've already given the answer, I think, as we understand it. That is by prayer uh, and, of course, by activism. 
uh, like good evangelicals, we're activists, mm -hmm. but we believe that it's not just activism. It's got to be that which is backed up and motivated by prayer. Uh, I love God's Word. I read it about, I, I read it for many years, four times a year completely. I love dwelling in the scriptures and getting new insights and seeing deeper and deeper. But I believe that that's only to be done by prayer. It isn't by more PhDs in this bit of theology and that bit of theology. It's by people who live in the book by prayer. And that's where you touch into the real heart of God. And I don't believe there's anything that we're doing that should not be done out of a prayer life where we're in fellowship, in communion. In fact, it's what, of course, is at the basis of abide in me and I in you. Mm -hmm. Ask what you will and it shall be done in my name. And that is the objective that we aim at. And if we can motivate people throughout this country into prayer, when it's evangelism or whether it's Bible reading or whatever it is in church life, if we can move the church back into prayer and, dare I say, and away from the television set a bit or whatever, <laughs> so that we are praying people once again, I think we will reach the people of this country because mm -hmm. there, uh, there are thousands out there who have got hungry hearts and they don't know where to get them filled. Mm. Uh, we saw people come to the Lord last Sunday and uh, we expect to see people come to the Lord next Sunday. And it's that attitude of heart as we keep mm. going out and making Christ known that we are really yes. will find an answer. Mm. I think, you know, what I feel we need for the church in this country again is to really take hold of what Paul said when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And I feel that for many, many people, they, um, they either make a divide between their secular, you know, their job and their faith, um, and therefore they're not really um, just standing up as a Christian and saying, I believe in Jesus, being unashamed of the gospel. Now, one of the reasons we sometimes get ashamed of the gospel is we're ashamed of the representation of it in church. And so that's why we've always believed that we need to have a church which is real, it needs to be a, pe a group of people who understand friendship with God and friendship with one another and therefore can open that friendship to others. So it's very important, I think, how we do church, if you like, um, insofar as it must be real, not just religious framework. But then out of that reality, we shouldn't be ashamed of the good news because we should be able to show that there is an alternative community called the church which can live the gospel and yet we can go out into the world in secular roles. We, we have people in all sorts of professions, and, but unashamed to be Christians because they see that Jesus really makes a difference. And we're not, we're not just blindly embracing something. We are thoughtful about our faith, which is why we believe so much in teaching. That's why mm. Roger does so much teaching, mm. because people understanding the rationality of our faith, its value, its power to change, as well as the prayer base, these things, are, all of them are interlinked really, are what then will enable us to say to the world, we do have something that's worthwhile. We have a power in Jesus that can transform individuals, families, change our, the youth of our nation like so many. We, our hearts break when we see these terrible incidents on the streets of London because youth are disaffected. We've got to get out there again. So, but the church needs to recover its nerve. We're almost back where we were when we began in the nation, which is the church has often lost its nerve. Um, we need not to lose our nerve. And whilst we believe utterly in community action, we have practiced that from the beginning to serve the serve into our communities. We ran a program from the very beginning called Jesus Action where we offered practical help to people in need. There wasn't any other church doing that as such. And we did all sorts of things from changing a light bulb to fixing somebody's fence or gate to... Um, we believe in serving people, but that it, we serve them also by our message of hope. So we've always been unashamedly evangelistic with words as well as with actions. Right. I was trying to think of a word which really described the work that you've been doing, particularly in London and, and overseas. And I guess the word pioneer came, came to my mind because the, as you yeah. started the work and as you developed, and I looked at what the dictionary describes pioneer as, and it says to be the first to open or prepare the way or one who opens up new areas of thought. 
Now, one of the areas that you're really pushing on is the whole role of men and women, or mm. women and men. Mm -hmm. Roger, you're clearly a teacher, uh, an, an intellectual teacher, and yet you've felt the freedom to allow your wife also to be involved in, in teaching and preaching. And uh, you, Faith, were the first lady who stood on the platform at Spring mm. Harvest and, mm -hmm. and spoke. Why do you feel so passionately um, about the releasing of women into ministry? Well, it doubles the number of people available <laughs> to make Christ known. Mm -hmm. There's a lovely verse in the Old Testament prophesying the New Testament days. In fact, it's the same psalm that talks about when he rose up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Uh, it's psalm 68. And that's, uh, if you take that and you find it in Ephesians chapter 4. And it says, uh, the, the same psalm says, The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of women who proclaimed it. And women are first-class evangelists, <laughs> whether it's Catherine Kuhlman or anybody else, mm -hmm. or whether it's Catherine Booth. Uh, women have proclaimed. Now, it's very nice to be called a pioneer, but uh, John Wesley was before me, and he set women off to, preaching the gospel. Uh, Booth and Catherine Booth, they were before us and they got the women on the move. It's nothing novel that we're doing. In fact, mm. in my little book, or our little book, I should say, we've uh, got a list through history in every century mm. of some outstanding woman mm. who was a proclaimer and a teacher of God's mm. truth. And we want to see uh, uh, double the number mm. of people getting on and making Christ known in every possible way. I think, you know, if you believe, as we do, uh, along with Martin Luther, by the way, in the priesthood of all believers, and even Luther acknowledged that, that if we believe that, that must include women and children and too. Children, yeah. um, but anyway, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, but we also believe in spiritual gifts. And if you think about it, the spiritual gifts don't say this is for men and this is for women, do they? They're just gifts of the Spirit given as He will. So it's not that we think, oh, no, we must have an equal number of men and women. We're not, we're not kind of tokenists like that but we believe in in spiritual gifting so where there is a spiritual gifting it is irrelevant if the holy spirit doesn't mind whether the person he's operating through is male or female then we don't either um, the spiritual gifts are will be seen in women and they are we know that and so it's more acknowledging where the gifting is we don't practice tokenism as such we just look for where the gifts of god are we encourage everybody to grow mm -hmm. in the holy spirit and in their spiritual giftings and then if we see a gift there then we will recognize it when it comes to leadership, there are certain qualities. Of, you can, for example, prophesy without necessarily being recognized as a prophet. Those are more, if you like, offices of the church. And if before we do that, we would look to see more the, the disciplines of leadership. There are disciplines. Um, we have to be responsible. You know what um, it says in James, let not many of you be teachers because you know that teachers will receive the greater condemnation. So we wouldn't encourage it in a very, you know, irresponsible way for people to become recognized as teachers. But if they have the disciplines of leadership in their life as well, then um, we would. Mm. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? Mm. That that's yeah. the way we operate. And so we, we see, have women leaders. We see well. nothing in the scripture that forbids women to get on with the gospel. I, I can imagine, Roger, the moment you said that, that, that our mailbag will be mm. full of people who will yes. disagree with you. I mean, I've been, I've been fascinating. Yeah. I've been yes. looking at your book, Women yes. and, and the Kingdom, yes. written by both of you. And I was yes. interested yes. that you chose two heroes, both of whom were, were, were yes. ladies uh, to it. Yes, but, but we all want to be biblical. Yes. And, and when it comes to, to the whole realm of women and uh, whether women are being released into to ministry and particularly mm -hmm. certain types of ministry. We really struggle. So how do you, how do you answer? I mean, we don't want to go into the, the, all the passages of Scripture which say this, that, and the next. But, I mean, how do you answer those <coughs> who say, look, the stance that you're taking is, is not one that can be supported from Scripture? Well, I would say that mostly it's because people text-proof, like uh, some sects and some evangelicals, they just find a verse anywhere and throw it out and that's the answer. When in actual fact the Bible is a total revelation and it's the whole word of God that we have to consider to try and find a, a, 
if you like, an answer to this particular question. And if we went back to the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't find anything there that said that the woman was not to teach. We go into Abraham and we find that Sarah, Rebecca, they are, are equally anointed. We go to Moses and we find that Moses had uh, uh, Miriam who led Israel with him, as it says later on in the Minor Prophets. And we find too that uh, we move into the era where Moses, uh, uh, the teaching of the law operated. And we've got Deborah who certainly led the people of Israel. If she didn't, there would have been a lot of problems. And so we move on, there's Holder and others. This is the totality of the Word of God. And when we get to Jesus, Jesus accepted all that Moses said, because he said he hasn't come to destroy it, he's come to fulfill it. And so obviously the attitude that Moses had to women, the attitude that Abraham had who came before Moses to women, and so on. And so nothing is said at all. The only problem is the time we get to Paul. Now, and the interesting thing is that uh, if we are uh, Christians, we believe that the whole Bible is important. Mm. If we were Muslims, of course, we would say the later things that were said will cancel out the previous. That's how they interpret the Quran. Mm. But the last things that were said by Paul that might appear to be a little bit different, two places only, or despite the fact he said there's neither male nor female in Christ, but uh, those two places which cause a few problems well, you can buy the book, of course, but on the other hand, what I'm saying is the totality of the Word of God right up to that point, whatever Paul said and whatever he meant, it cannot cancel what has already gone mm -hmm. uh, because we don't believe that. Neither did Jesus. He said it wasn't so from the beginning. And uh, Moses didn't cancel out Abraham, according to Paul. Mm -hmm. And Jesus didn't cancel out Moses, according to Matthew chapter 5, so, and so on. So the totality of God's Word is to show that where there is gifting, it must be used. And if there are any restraints or restrictions, they are the things which must be interpreted in the light of what's gone before. Okay. Faith, I can imagine that there are ladies who are listening to the program who maybe are in a home situation and a church situation where really the, the, they feel that they're oppressed and, and repressed. Mm -hmm. If you're going to encourage them and uh, maybe you could pray for them as well. I wonder if you just look at your camera over mm -hmm. there and could, could just speak into it for a moment and just encourage some of those who are watching today. Well, the wonderful thing about God is that he never, ever puts us down. He recognises, in fact, that often we feel put down and he lifts the needy, um, he lifts us up. And therefore, when we do feel repressed or put down, we know that God doesn't do it. And the Holy Spirit is here to empower us not to be proud, not to be arrogant, but to be people of the Spirit of God. I believe the Spirit of God does make room for us also. I think we have to keep our attitudes right, obviously, and we ha I do respect leadership. If I feel God's put me in a church, I do respect the leadership flow. Um, I think that's important for us as people. Um, but on the other hand, I believe the Spirit of God will keep leading us into a place of freedom because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So let's continue to be people of the Holy Spirit because in the end, that's what the church needs and that's what the world needs and that's what God blesses. And I believe God does make room for us. It says in Proverbs, a person's gift makes room for them. And I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit within us will make room for us if God has called us to, to minister in his body and beyond his body into our needy world. Thank you. Could you pray for... Yes, for folks. yes. Jesus, I just ask that your spirit will come and touch everyone who's watching this program now, especially, Lord, those that you are calling to speak out more in their workplace, in the home, or in church. Lord, I pray that there may be a true washing of your spirit through the structures of the churches of which we're part. And Lord, I ask we may see more and more of your kingdom coming through us all, men and women. Will you encourage, comfort, strengthen as you love to do, Lord, today? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Roger, we've only got two or three minutes left on the program. Uh, you're, you're involved in Evangelical Alliance, in Tear Fund, you, you're involved in local church and in a much wider ministry. As you look out, are you encouraged for the church in this country or discouraged? I'm encouraged and I think I always will be 
And now that's sort of begging the question away because there, you remember it says about our Lord's government that there will be no end and it will increase. And it is increasing. It's increasing worldwide. It may look as though it's running down a bit in this country, but I think that where we're at today, having run down maybe, and maybe plateaued out, where we've got a stronger, a more uh, virile kind of church where people know what they believe to some degree, whereas we had a lot of hangers-on, say, 40, 50 years ago. Now the thin red line knows <laughs> that it is a thin red line and we're going to stand our ground. I think we have people too who b the church as a whole in this country is very clearly being exercised about prayer. We are beginning to pray more effectively, powerfully, and we're trying to stir each other up for more prayer. There is no answer unless there's prayer. Every revival has been preceded by a prayer movement of some form or other, and we're looking forward to seeing that flower out into an impact into our country where the nerve is recovered again for the gospel. The gospel really does work. It changes people's lives, and for us to begin speaking it out, despite some of the hindrances that have arisen with the way that um, the so-called equality bills and all these political things, as well as the way that we've been treated in some parts to um, even evoke a debate in Parliament that uh, Christians are being put down and being uh, discriminated against. Despite those sorts of things happening in the country, I believe that the church is beginning to rise up in this country far more powerfully than we've seen it for a long time. And we may see, I'm looking forward to seeing, not only uh, signs and wonders, they do help faith a little bit, not only good apologetics again being spoken at, that helps too, but in the end, people whose hearts know that Jesus does change lives and he's going to go on changing them, whatever anybody might say. Let's get going with that. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time today to come and to, to share you. with us. Uh, as you go out, you've got lots of church things that you're going to be involved with and Christian things. Any time for any hobbies? Do you have any? <laughs> Just a quick fire um. question, that was. <laughs> well, my main hobby, which was looking after the gardens, has been taken over by my son-in-law who lives with us, and he's doing a much better job than I could do. I, I love gardening and I right. love reading, but I, that's been a little bit affected by... Uh, problem in the eye recently um yeah i love yeah. writing i love writing i write i write uh, articles for a, a magazine from right. time to time a sort of to help people to think it's not a christian clientele um sort of an opinion article i love doing that and i love writing poetry from time to time so All those right. are my hobbies well enjoy writing your poetry and enjoy <laughs> your you. reading thank you so much for being thank with you. us my guest today roger and faith foster thank you